In this question, we have to determine the electric potential at point P, and that electric potential is being set up or produced by this continuous charge distribution. This rod has a linear charge density of positive two microcoulombs per meter. And what makes this question challenging is that we do not have a handful of just point charges. You probably have seen some questions where you have point charges arranged in space and then you have to calculate the potential at a particular location. But in this case, we again don't have a handful of just a few point charges. We have a continuous charge distribution. There's basically an uncountable number of charges along this rod. So we have to end up using calculus to figure this out. And to begin to understand that, why don't we come down below and blow up the picture a little bit. And what we'll do is superimpose a y-axis here, and then we already have an x-axis running horizontally across the picture. And in order to proceed, we select a charge element along the rod. So a charge element is basically a little piece of the rod. It's so little that the length of it we usually represent as dx. dx is a calculus notation to represent a very tiny length. So there is that very tiny length, and that little tiny piece of the rod has a certain amount of charge, and we call that charge dq. Now, one very important relationship between dq and dx is as follows. So dq, which again is the tiny amount of charge on that little element of the rod, is equal to the linear charge density, lambda, times the length of that charge element, which is dx. Now, to see why this makes some sense, recall that the linear charge density has units of coulombs per meter, and then the length of our little charge element, dx, would have units of meters. And when you multiply coulombs per meter by meters, the meters would cancel, and that would leave you with just coulombs. That would be consistent with our claim that that little charge element has a small amount of charge on it, dq measured in coulombs. So this relationship hopefully makes sense to us. And then what we want to remember is that in order to calculate the electric potential as the result of a point charge, we would use the following equation. 1 over 4 pi epsilon, which is a constant, multiplied by the charge, and then multiplied by the distance from that charge to the location of interest. In this case, that distance would be represented right here. Here, that's the distance from our little charge element to point P. We could call that distance R. Now, we're going to slightly modify this equation because we don't have a point charge. We have a differential element of charge, but it's basically the same thing. So we're going to rewrite the electric potential equation as follows. It will be dV, which simply represents the electric potential produced by that little elemental charge along the rod, equals the constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon multiplied by the charge, which will be dq, and then divided by that distance r. Now let's recall that dq can be substituted with the expression of lambda times dx. Whoa, so we're gonna go in there and replace dq with lambda times dx. and then that's divided by r. Now we're doing a good job, but the problem right now is we have two variables. x is a variable because it will change depending on where we locate that differential element along the length of the rod. And then r will change in turn because as we change the location of that differential element, we're gonna change the length r as well. So we can't really proceed with two different variables. We want just a single variable. And so what we're gonna do is look carefully at our right triangle formed right here. Now we know from the diagram that one leg of the triangle is lowercase d. The other leg is actually x. So remember right here is the origin of the diagram. And if we're measuring from the origin to the location of our differential element, then that would simply be a distance x. So that's the other leg, and then we have the distance along the hypotenuse labeled r. Now, of course, from the Pythagorean theorem, we know that r squared is equal to x squared plus d squared. If we square root both sides of that equation, we would see that r 
can be expressed as the square root of x squared plus little d squared. So that's the substitution we're going to make. We're going to replace r with that expression. And what's really nice about this is we're going to have an expression in terms of just a single variable x. And there we have it. And so now that represents the electric potential contributed by that single charge element. We need, of course, the electric potential contributed by all of the charge elements along the length of the rod. So we have to add up, essentially, all the different little charge elements along the length of the rod, and that would require calculus. You will recall from calculus that to add up an infinite number of little items, you basically have to integrate. So we're going to integrate both sides of this equation. And when we're integrating, we need to figure out the limits of integration. We need a lower limit and an upper limit. We return back to the diagram, looking for the lower limit and the upper limit of integration. Let's clean this up just a little bit. So the lower limit of integration would be the leftmost end of the rod, which we can see is symbolized by capital D. And the upper limit would be the rightmost side of the rod, which is the distance symbolized by capital L. So in other words, we're going to integrate from big D to big L. Those will serve as the limits of integration. There they are. Now, the left side integral of dV, relatively easy. That's just going to equal V. That's a basic calculus integration. And then to proceed efficiently, we're going to factor out some constants. Let's remember that lambda, the linear charge density, is a constant. This term here also is a constant. So when we factor that out, we're going to have lambda over 4 pi epsilon multiplied by the integral from d to l of dx over the square root of x squared plus lowercase d squared. Now this integral could get a little bit dicey. We could use the tools of calculus to prove to ourselves what that integral is. However, your physics textbook has a list of common or somewhat common integrals in the back of the book. Here is one of them. This is the one that we're going to be using. You can see the similarity here between this expression and this expression right here. The only difference, of course, is that the book's version has a lowercase a, whereas ours has a lowercase d. So basically, we're just going to switch this to a lowercase d, and then we can use this formula to integrate. So that means that our integral will be as follows. So we still have the constant, and then this is going to be multiplied by the natural log, parentheses, of x plus the square root of x squared plus lowercase d squared, and then the limits of integration, again, will be from d to l. All right, we're making some good progress here. Now, we recall from calculus that we have to plug the upper limit in first. So we're going to fill in capital L for those x's. We're going to keep this constant in front of our answer. So this is going to be multiplied by the natural log parentheses. Plug in the L, so capital L plus the square root, capital L squared, plus lowercase d squared. That looks good. And then subtract that by the quantity you obtain by plugging the lower limit in for x. So in this case, that's capital D. So you get ln of capital D plus the square root of capital D squared plus lowercase d squared. OK, this is our expression. And we probably want to simplify it, make our lives a little bit easier. We recall that the natural log of a quantity A, we'll say, minus the natural log of a quantity B is equivalent to the natural log of A divided by B. So in this case, if we look kind of carefully here, this could be our sort of A, and this could be our B. So we can condense this expression just a little bit to make it a little bit more convenient to us. So it's going to be multiplied by the natural log, and then we're going to have L plus the square root of L squared plus lowercase d squared divided by d plus the square root of d squared plus lowercase d squared. Okay, that's looking a little bit better. We go back up to the given information and we see this very bizarre stuff here. It says d equals capital D, which equals L over 4. 
So I don't know what they were thinking when they devised that, but we can rewrite that. D is equal to uppercase D, which is L over four. So I guess what we wanna do is change all these L's and D's just to a single variable. Or I guess a single constant, technically. Why don't we choose to express them in terms of L, I suppose. So we're gonna have LN bracket. You're gonna have L plus the square root of L squared plus, now this little d, we can see little d is L over four. So you're gonna have L over four, but then don't forget to square that. Very interesting. Over here, uppercase d is also L over four. Underneath this radical, Let's see here, you have capital D squared plus little d. Little d is the same thing as capital D, so this is actually capital D squared plus capital D squared, which is actually two capital D squared, but then capital D is L over four. So it would look something like that. I know that's weird. Okay, so I'm thinking here that miraculously these L's are going to cancel out. Hopefully we can prove that to ourselves. This is where the fun begins. So we're gonna have L, plus the square root, we're gonna have under here L squared plus L squared over 16 over L over four plus the square root. Let's see, you're gonna have two times L squared over 16. So two L squared over 16. And I guess this stuff is just gonna keep copying and pasting. There we go. Let's see here. Underneath the radical, we could try to find a common denominator. And so we can make this L squared over one. So that is going to become 16 L squared over 16 plus L squared over 16. Interesting. Over L over four. I guess this is going to reduce, we might want to just square root this. So this becomes radical two L over four. That made our lives slightly easier, I suppose. Continuing the journey here, underneath the upper square root in the numerator, ooh, let's not forget the LN here, holy smokes. So we're gonna have 17, up, up in here, we're gonna have 17 L squared over 16 underneath the square root. But then when you square root that, we'll, we'll cut some steps out here. You're gonna have L plus radical 17 L over four. And then this is all over, here you're gonna have L plus radical two L all over four. And to simplify this further, why don't we multiply everything by four? So if we multiply this by four, multiply that by four, multiply this by four, you're gonna end up with four L plus radical 17 L over L plus radical two L. I know I'm omitting some of the other stuff here. The L's are all gonna cancel, it looks like. So you're gonna end up with four plus radical 17 over one plus radical two. That was in front of an LN, and then it also had this stuff in front as well. Okay, neat. So now we can plug finally in lambda. Lambda was given as two microcoulombs per meter. Two microcoulombs per meter. Now microcoulombs will be expressed as coulombs, as two times 10 to the minus sixth coulombs per meter. There we go. Then you have four pi times that constant epsilon is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, and then times the natural log of this rather dastardly looking thing right here. So let's just put that in as follows. All right, let's pick up our calculators and punch this in. And when we do that, we get an electric potential of about 21,820. The standard unit would be volts. That would be the correct answer to the question.